Chapter 2, Part 1 Rumors drifted up through the Meadowlands, into the cities of the Hyborians. The word ran along the caravans, the long camel trains plodding through the sands, herded by lean, hawk-eyed men in white caftans. It was passed on by the hook-nosed herdsmeslands. From the dwellers in tents to the dwellers in the squat stone cities where kings with curled blue-black beards worshipped round-bellied gods with curious rites. The word passed up through the fringe of hills where gaunt tribesmen took toll of the caravans. The rumors came into the fertile uplands where stately cities rose above blue lakes and rivers. The rumors marched along the broad white roads thronged with ox wains, with lowing herds, with rich merchants, knights in steel, archers, and priests. There were rumors from the desert that lies east of Stygia, far south of the Kothian hills. A new prophet had risen among the nomads. Men spoke of tribal war, of a gathering of vultures in the southeast, and a terrible leader who led his swiftly increasing hordes to victory. The Stygians, ever a menace to the northern nations, were apparently not connected with this movement. For they were massing armies on their eastern borders and their priests were making magic to fight that of the desert sorcerer, whom men called Natok, the Veiled One for his features were always masked. But the tide swept northwestward, and the blue-bearded kings died before the altars of their pot-bellied gods, and their squat-walled cities were drenched in blood. Men said that the uplands of the Hyborians were the goal of Natok and his chanting votaries. Raids from the desert were not uncommon, but this latest movement seemed to promise more than a raid. Rumor said Natok had welded thirty nomadic tribes and fifteen cities into his following, and that a rebellious Stygian prince had joined him. This latter lent the affair an aspect of real war. Characteristically, most of the Hyborian nations were prone to ignore the growing menace. But in Karaja, carved out of Shemite lands by the swords of Kothic adventurers, heed was given. Lying southeast of Koth, it would bear the brunt of the invasion. And its young king was captive to the treacherous king of Ophir, who hesitated between restoring him for a huge ransom, or handing him over to his enemy, the penurious king of Koth. Who offered no gold, but an advantageous treaty. Meanwhile, the rule of the struggling kingdom was in the white hands of young princess Yasmala, the king's sister. Minstrel sang her beauty throughout the western world, and the pride of a kingly dynasty was hers. But on that night her pride was dropped from her like a cloak. In her chamber whose ceiling was a lapis lazuli dome, whose marble floor was littered with rare furs, and whose walls were lavish with golden frieze work, ten girls, daughters of nobles. Their slender limbs weighted with gem-crusted armlets and anklets, slumbered on velvet couches about the royal bed with its golden dais and silken canopy. But Princess Yasmala lolled not on that silken bed. She lay naked on her supple belly up marble like the most abased suppliant, her dark hair streaming over her white shoulders, her slender fingers intertwined. She lay and writhed in pure horror that froze the blood in her lithe limbs and dilated her beautiful eyes, that pricked the roots of her dare and made goose flesh rise along her supple spine. Above her, in the darkest corner of the marble chamber, lurked a vast shapeless shadow. It was no living thing of form or flesh and blood. It was a clot of darkness, a blur in the sight, a monstrous night-born incubus that might have been deemed a figment of a sleep-drugged brain. But for the points of blazing yellow fire that glimmered like two eyes from the blackness. Moreover, a voice issued from it, a low subtle inhuman sibilance that was more like the soft abominable hissing of a serpent than anything else. And that apparently could not emanate from anything with human lips. Its sound as well as its import filled Yasmala with a shuddering horror so intolerable that she writhed and twisted her slender body as if beneath a lash. As though to rid her mind of its insinuating vileness by physical contortion. You are marked for mine, princess came the gloating whisper. Before I awakened from the long sleep I had marked you, and yearned for you. But I was held fast by the ancient spell by which I escaped mine enemies. 
I am the soul of Nato, the veiled one. Look well upon me, princess. Soon you shall behold me in my bodily guise, and shall love me. Ghostly hissing dwindled off in lustful titterings, and Yasmala moaned and beat the marble tiles with her small fists in her ecstasy of terror. I sleep in the palace chamber of Akbatana. The sibilances continued. There my body lies in its frame of bones and flesh. But it is but an empty shell from which the spirit has flown for a brief space. Could you gaze from that palace casement you would realize the futility of resistance. The desert is a rose garden beneath the moon, where blossom the fires of a hundred thousand warriors. As an avalanche sweeps onward, gathering bulk and momentum, I will sweep into the lands of mine ancient enemies. Their kings shall furnish me skulls for goblets, but their women and children shall be slaves of my slaves' slaves. I have grown strong in the long years of dreaming. But thou shalt be my queen, O princess. I will teach thee the ancient forgotten ways of pleasure. B. Before the stream of cosmic obscenity which poured from the shadowy colossus, Yasmala cringed and writhed as if from a whip that flayed her dainty bare flesh. Member. Whispered the horror. The days will not be many before I come to claim mine own. Yasmala, pressing her face against the tiles and stopping her pink ears with her dainty fingers, yet seemed to hear a strange sweeping noise, like the beat of bat wings. Then, looking fearfully up, she saw only the moon that shone through the window with a beam that rested like a silver sword across the spot where the phantom had lurked. Trembling in every limb, she rose and staggered to a satin couch, where she threw herself down, weeping hysterically. The girls slept on, but one, who roused, yawned, stretched her slender figure and blinked about. Instantly she was on her knees beside the couch, her arms about Yasmala's supple waist. Was it? Was it? Her dark eyes were wide with fright. Yasmala caught her in a convulsive grasp. Oh, Vatisa. It him again. I saw it. Heard it speak. It spoke its name, Natik. It is Natik. It is not the nightmare. It towered over me while the girls slept like drugged ones. What oh, what shall I do? Vatisa twisted a golden bracelet about her rounded arm in meditation. Oh, princess. She said, It is evident that no mortal power can deal with it. And the charm is useless that the priests of Ishtar gave you. Therefore seek you the forgotten oracle of Mitra. In spite of her recent fright, Yasmala shuddered. The gods of yesterday become the devils of tomorrow. The Kothians had long since abandoned the worship of Mitra, forgetting the attributes of the universal Hyborian god. Yasmala had a vague idea that, being very ancient, it followed that the deity was very terrible. Ishtar was much to be feared, and all the gods of Koth. Kothian culture and religion had suffered from a subtle admixed tour of Shemite and Stygian strains. The simple ways of the Hyborians had become modified to a large extent by the sensual, luxurious, yet despotic habits of the East. Will me try aid me? Yasmala caught Vatisa's wrist in her eagerness. We have worshipped Ishtar so long. To be sure he will. Vatisa was the daughter of an Afarian priest who had brought his customs with him when he fled from political enemies to Karaja. Seek the shrine. I will go with you. I will. Yasma arose, but objected when Vatisa prepared to dress her. It is not fitting that I come before the shrine clad in silk. I will go naked, on my knees, as befits a suppliant, lest be my lility. Nonsense. Vatisa had scant respect for the ways of what she deemed a false cult. Mitra would have folks stand upright before him, not crawling on their bellies like worms, or spilling blood of animals all over his altars. Thus objurgated, Yasmala allowed the girl to garb her in the light sleeveless silk shirt, over which was slipped a silken tunic, bound at the waist by a wide velvet girdle. Satin slippers were put upon her slender feet, and a few deft touches of Vatisa's pink fingers arranged her dark wavy tresses. Then the princess followed the girl, who drew aside a heavy gilt-work tapestry and threw the golden bolt of the door it concealed. This led into a narrow winding corridor, 
and down this the two girls went swiftly, through another door and into a broad hallway. Here stood a guardsman in crested gilt helmet, silvered cuirass and gold-chased greaves, with a long-shafted battle-axe in his hands. Motion from Yasmala checked his exclamation and, saluting, he took his stand again beside the doorway, motionless as a brazen image. The girls traversed the hallway, which seemed immense and eerie in the light of the cressets along the lofty walls, and went down a stairway where Yasmala shivered at the blots of shadows which hung in the angles of the walls. Three levels down they halted at last in a narrow corridor whose arched ceiling was crusted with jewels, whose floor was set with blocks of crystal, and whose walls were decorated with golden frieze work. Down this shining way they stole, holding each other's hands, to a wide portal of guilt. Vatista thrust open the door, revealing a shrine long forgotten except by a faithful few, and royal visitors to Karaja's court, mainly for whose benefit the fane was maintained. Yasmala had never entered it before, though she was born in the palace. Plain and unadorned in comparison to the lavish display of Ishtar's shrines, there was about it a simplicity of dignity and beauty characteristic of the Mitran religion. The ceiling was lofty, but it was not domed, and was of plain white marble, as were the walls and floor, the former with a narrow gold frieze running about them. Behind an altar of clear green jade, unstained with sacrifice, stood the pedestal whereon sat the material manifestation of the deity. Yasmala looked in awe at the sweep of the magnificent shoulders, the clear-cut features, the wide straight eyes, the patriarchal beard, the thick curls of the hair, confined by a simple band about the temples. This, though she did not know it, was art in its highest form the free, uncramped artistic expression of a highly aesthetic race, unhampered by conventional symbolism. She fell on her knees and thence prostrate, regardless of Vatisa's admonition, and Vatisa, to be on the safe side, followed her example. For after all, she was only a girl, and it was very awesome in Mitra's shrine. But even so she could not refrain from whispering in Yasmala's ear. This is but the emblem of the god, none pretends to know what Mitra looks like. This but represents him in idealized human form, as near perfection as the human mind can conceive. He does not inhabit this cold stone, as your priests tell you Ishtar does. He is everywhere, above us, and about us, and he dreams betimes in the high places among the stars. But here his being focuses. Therefore call upon him. What shall I say? Whispered Yasmala in stammering terror. Before you can speak, Mitra knows the contents of your mind. Began Vatisa. Then both girls started violently as a voice began in the air above them. Deep, calm, bell-like tones emanated no more from the image than from anywhere else in the chamber. Again Yasmala trembled before a bodiless voice speaking to her, but this time it was not from horror or repulsion. Speak not, my daughter, for I know your need, came the intonations like deep musical waves beating rhythmically along a golden beach. In one manner may you save your kingdom, and saving it, save all the world from the fangs of the serpent which has crawled up out of the darkness of the ages. Go forth upon the streets alone, and place your kingdom in the hands of the first man you meet there. The unechoing tone ceased, and the girls stared at each other. Then, rising, they stole forth, nor did they speak until they stood once more in Yasmala's chamber. The princess stared out of the gold-barred windows. The moon had set. It was long past midnight. Sounds of revelry had died away in the gardens and on the roofs of the city. Karaja slumbered beneath the stars, which seemed to be reflected in the cressets that twinkled among the gardens and along the streets and on the flat roofs of houses where folk slept. What will you do? Whispered Tisa, all a tremble. Give me my cloak answered Yasmala, setting her teeth. But alone, in the streets, at this hour, expostulated Vatisa. Mitra has spoken, replied the princess. It might have been the voice of the god, or a trick of a priest. No matter. I will go. Wrapping a voluminous silken cloak about her lithe figure and donning a velvet cap from which depended a filmy veil, 
She passed hurriedly through the corridors and approached a bronze door where a dozen spearmen gaped at her as she passed through. This was a wing of the palace which led directly onto the street, on all other sides it was surrounded by broad gardens, bordered by a high wall. She emerged into the street, lighted by cressets placed at regular intervals. She hesitated, then, before her resolution could falter, she closed the door behind her. 